Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. I'm going to continue the study of the book of John tonight. Uh, I think we've done four or five hours already, and that's just to get through chapter number one. Uh, if you have not seen those previous studies, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and watch them because the first chapter of the book of John is really one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. So please watch those. I'm going to continue tonight with uh, chapter two, and I'm going to read it in the KJV first because I am a KJV firstist. Uh, I probably will look at it also in the Amplified because the Amplified translation is really more of a commentary, uh, so it may be helpful to me. So uh, let me begin. Um, John chapter 2, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Uh, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Well, first of all, when it says in the very beginning, it says, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Uh, it seems to be disjointed from chapter one. Now, I've said this numerous times before, but uh, I don't know what date it first happened, uh, but at some point in time, uh, translators and publishers started dividing the scriptures up into chapters and verse numbers, and they added punctuation and capitalization and these things were added that uh, uh, it's really not the way the scriptures were originally. Now, we don't have the original manuscripts. When John wrote this down himself, it was copied and recopied. And uh, we, we have several generations later, the, some of these very old copies. And I trust them that they're exactly right. Uh, but when we look back at those old manuscripts, uh, they didn't come with, you know, titles and subtitles and chapter numbers. Now, a lot of people have studied this and uh, uh, concluded that particularly in the King James Version, uh, that the uh, chapter chapters and verses are very significant when they look at Bible numerology. I don't want to get sidetracked into that. But some people believe that the division of the, uh, the book into chapters and verses uh, is, was also uh, inspired by God. Uh, I'm not going to take that position or, uh, or argue for or against that depiction, uh, position, but I just want you to be aware of it. Uh, but it seems to me, when I look at the last verse of chapter 1, let's go back and look at that. It says, um, I'll read the last two verses, uh, the last three verses. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now you see, and the third day, I don't see any connection there uh, to the, the last verse of chapter one. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified and see if they have uh, expounded on it at all in their translation to see if it may be helpful. So the Amplified verse one of chapter two says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee. 
and the mother of Jesus was there. So you see, um, I, the only thing I can uh, speculate is on the third day, it would be uh, um, that it was the third day of the week. Uh, see that the Sabbath would be uh, uh, Saturday. So the first day is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Maybe it's saying this was marriage happened on a Tuesday on the third day. Uh, I don't really know about, uh, I don't really have a strong uh, opinion on that, but it just doesn't seem to flow with the um, last verse of the first chapter. Maybe that's part of the reason they decided to do a, a chapter division at this point and say, this is a new, cha new chapter. Uh, so let me read this now, first few verses in the Amplified. Uh, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine was all gone, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus said to her, dear woman. Now, they've inserted the word dear, because in the KJV, it just says woman. So they are inserting that. Uh, it's, it's a it's a word that shows affection uh, for his mother. But in the KJV, he simply says, woman, uh, what is that to you and to me? My time, and they've added, to act and to be revealed has not yet come. So the thing that stands out to me that we'll, we'll see probably numerous times uh, as we go through this whole book of John, uh, when the mother of Jesus is referenced, uh, I know that Jesus honors his mother. I mean, he followed uh, the law perfectly. And uh, the fourth commandment is honor thy father and mother. So uh, we know that Jesus followed perfectly. No one's ever followed perfectly except Jesus. So he honors his mother, but it, there's times in the scriptures when you see something like this, and it doesn't seem to be like he is uh, showing her the kind of respect that some people would expect to his mother. He just says, woman. And, you know, women were considered to be like second class at that time. They didn't have all the full rights and all of the... Um, um, uh, the the uh, level of esteem that a man had, uh, the inheritance went to a man. The, 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 the first male born in a family was the uh, uh, preeminent, the first uh, the firstborn is a title for the one that's preeminent, and it's, it's the male, not the female. And so here in KJV, it says, oops, let me go back to the KJV again. says, um, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Uh, mine hour is not yet come. Uh, you see, there's a, there's a giant religious cult in the world called Roman Catholicism. I have a playlist titled uh, Roman Catholicism Debunked. Now, if you think that I'm being severe or extreme or unkind, uh, I hope you will go watch that playlist on Roman Catholicism Debunked so you can understand the history, the, uh, the origin, the uh, false doctrines of Roman Catholicism. Uh, so that then you'll understand the serious serious problem so that you'll know that it is not even a a uh, part of christianity uh, so uh, in romanism roman catholicism i'm going to refer to it as romanism in romanism they elevate mary in a lot of ways 
she's the co-redemptress, redemptor. I forgot the word exactly, but co-redeemer. In other words, you're not saved just by Jesus, but you're saved by Mary too. Uh, they, they've really elevated Mary to the status of like goddess. And, and it's, uh, it's pretty, it's very sickening and appalling to me. But when we look at the scriptures, it's Mary and how Jesus uh, talked to her and related to her. She was not esteemed uh, in a way that you'd think that she had that kind of uh, near that kind of status. Uh, this is the first example we'll see, but there's many others. But so it strikes me that Jesus says, answers her. She says, they have no wine. He, Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now, what have I got to do with that? Or what have I got to do with you? What have I got to do with your idea about oh, remedying this lack of wine? And then he says, mine hour is not yet come. Uh, the hour for him to uh, be revealed. However, he was already revealed back in chapter one. Now, I think that these events here that we see in John, they are chronological. So it does seem uh, strange that when he was identified by John the Baptist, and then we have Andrew, Nathaniel, Peter, all these people leaving John the Baptist and going and following Jesus, declaring him to be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, uh, that it seems to me that the, the cat's out of the bag. And yet right here, uh, he's saying that my time has not yet come. Uh, maybe he's referring to my time to do miracles and show everybody who I am because he's already accepted the title. They've all referred to him as the Christ, the son of God, and he hasn't refuted any of them. He's accepted that, that title. Now let's look. At, uh, so Jesus said unto her woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Then his mother says, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She just totally ignored him. He says, don't bother me with this. It's this is the not the right time for me to be, you know, changing water to wine or doing any miraculous things. And, and uh, yet she just goes ahead and orders them to bring to, to do what he says because she's going to like be persistent until he until he gives in and does does a miracle. Now she must know at this point that uh, what what his ability is. I mean, after all, uh, when the angel um, Gabriel appeared to her, uh, you know, it should be no mystery to her who his her son is. She, she knows that she was in, uh, he was conceived uh, not of man. She was a virgin. And yet the Holy Spirit came over her and now she's pregnant and with uh, the Son of God. She, she's got to be aware of it. Even though there are some times in the scriptures you wonder, you know, what is she really thinking? But uh, it seems pretty clear that she knows who he is. She knows what he's able to do. And she's trying to get him to start doing it right here, right now. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, so he's already just going along with it. Uh, he's given in to his mother's insistence. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. All right, so they, he ordered them to fill the pots with water, and they did it. And they said, draw, out the, draw it out and give it to the, the governor of the feast. So between the time they filled it with water and they drew it out, 
we know what happened. The water was turned into wine. Yeah, uh, let me look at this in the Amplified, see how it phrases it. Okay. Uh, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification. That's ceremonial washing, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. 20 or 30 gallons each. So let's say there's 25 gallons and there's six of them. It's 150 gallons. That's a large party going to drink that much wine, 150 gallons of wine. Uh, Jesus says to the servants, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter of the banquet. Okay. I'll go back to the KJV. This is uh, coffee, not wine. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. So the wine that uh, Jesus made, he changed the water into wine. It's the good wine. It's really the highest quality of wine. And he was expecting, which is the norm, that you serve the, the good wine first to impress people. And then after they've been drinking for a while and they've gotten a little bit uh, inebriated from it, because this is real wine. It's not grape juice. I'll, I'll prove that in a moment. But uh, and th this very verse actually proves it. But... Uh, normally they give you the good wine at first because you're sober and you can really tell the difference, uh, you know, if it's in the quality of the wine. After you've been drinking for a while, you know, you're probably not as near as sensitive and can't appreciate it. So why waste good wine on someone that's already been drinking a lot and is like either drunk or half drunk? So that it's normal that you give them the cheaper wine later. But in this case, it's reversed. And the... Uh, this uh, the ruler of the feast is is really amazed by this. This is not what he expected. Let me look at that in the Amplify. You know, some people want to argue that uh, uh, when it's talking about wine, it's just grape juice. And when Jesus drank wine, it was just grape juice. It was not fermented. It was not alcoholic. That's clearly not, not the case. Uh, let me read this first, though. Verse 9. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had turned into wine, not knowing where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone else serves his best wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then he serves that which is not so good. But you have kept back the good wine until now. Well, first of all, this whole scenario here should be revealing to you if you're one of the people that thinks that this was non-alcoholic wine. Well, it, this whole uh, uh, statement here would be irrelevant if it was non-alcoholic wine. Uh, if it was not real wine, 
they, they, it would not make a difference between the beginning or later because their, their senses, their taste, their, their uh, coherence, everything would be equal. There's, uh, this is telling us that in the beginning, they're very sensitive and they can tell the good wine. Later on, they're not as sensitive to it and they couldn't even tell. So that could only be the result of, of having an alcoholic beverage or in this case, a lot of alcoholic beverages, because this is a big party. It's a wedding feast. I'm sure in occasions like this, they're going to drink a lot of wine and probably get drunk. Or at least uh, get very festive. Another reason that we know that uh, when it says wine in the Bible, um, first of all, it tells us to, we should not drink much wine. Uh, well, that's because it's alcoholic. It wouldn't tell you, don't, don't drink too much grape juice. You know, <laughs> why would it say, don't drink too much grape juice? Don't drink too much wine because alcoholic beverages can become a big problem in your life. You could become a drunk or an alcoholic. It can ruin your life. That's why it says, don't drink too much wine. And another example is, I will probably come to this. This story probably is in John. See, not, not the same stories are not necessarily in all four of these gospel accounts because you have four different people giving their recollections and some people remember other, one thing and other people remember another, another thing. And it's not a question of which is accurate. It's a question of the things that stand out to them and that they're, they're led to, to, to put into their uh, story. Uh, it's a it's a true story, a true narrative, but told from four different people, four different uh, perspectives. But so I think we're going to probably have in John. If it's not in John, you can find it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But it, there's a statement saying, "Do not put new wine into old wine skins." Now, why would it say that? It says it says because if you do. The bag will burst and it'll all be lost. The wine skin is destroyed. The, the, the wine spills out if you put new wine. Well, why would new wine burst an old wine skin? It's because when you put new wine, which is just grape juice that has not fermented and become alcoholic yet, when you put it, grape juice into the wine bag, uh, as it as it ferments and, and becomes alcoholic, it builds up gas inside that bag and it forces the bag to expand and reach to a, a point. If it expands too much, the bag would burst, but they know how to do it. So it expands enough and the bag stretched out and the wine is fermented and the bag is intact. But if you have the bag that's already stretched out to its capacity, and then you refill it with brand new, new wine again. The whole thing happens all over again. And the bag will, the wine will ferment. The gases build up. The wine stretches even further beyond its capacity and bursts. That's why the story goes, don't put new wine into an old wine skin or it'll burst. But it's also talking about the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's, it's an illustration of, of that. Don't mix the New Testament with the Old Testament. And that's been a big problem in the beginning of the church and even today. People are trying to hold on to uh, Old Testament Judaism and keep it that make that part of Christianity. You, you can't mix them. All right, so let me look now at the KJV again. Um, verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, there's a difference between disciples and apostles. And there's going to come a point where he's going to take all out of all the disciples Let's say he has 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 disciples. These are the people who are following him, sitting down, listening to him, learning, maybe taking notes and, and trying to learn from him as a, a, as a uh, student learns from a teacher. Uh, 
following him, serving him and learning from him. That's the, as a disciple. But from all of those disciples, he's going to come to a point where he's going to choose 12 of them to be the closest disciples and they, they get an elevated status of an apostle. But right now it says, um, and his disciples believed on him. Well, this miracle I'm sure helped, but I know that some of these people already believed on him because in the first chapter, we can see that John the Baptist, even though he was not a disciple, uh, he was the forerunner, the one he's in the uh, Elijah in, in the sense that he, he's the one of voice crying out in the wilderness and pointing to the Messiah saying, it's him, the Lamb of God. Uh, so he believed in him. And then Peter and Andrew, they threw down their fishing nets and they left everything behind and they, they came and followed him. And, and uh, he was referred to by Peter and, as the, the son of God and also by Nathaniel as the son of God. And uh, so we know that there's already some people who are believing on him even before he performed the miracle. But this is the first of the miracles. Now there's gonna be many of them. And as he does all these miracles, we ask, well, why is he doing it? What, you know, uh, could the, these people have lived without the wine at the feast? That what purpose does it serve? I mean, I can see the purpose of healing someone if they're lame and helping them so they can walk or see. But th these miracles were done so that people can believe on him. He, re he reaches a point eventually where he says to Thomas, after his resurrection, they all say, we've seen him, he's alive, he's alive. And Thomas wouldn't believe. And then Jesus came, appeared to Thomas and Thomas touched him and believed. Jesus said this, now that you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So this uh, believing without seeing is something that is, uh, that's what faith is. I haven't seen Jesus, but I have faith in him, even though I've never met him, but I believe the scriptures and I believe that, uh, you know, he is who he claims to be and that he will do what he promised to do, which is give me eternal life in heaven. I have faith in that, but the Bible says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it, scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. So there's something about believing in Jesus without having seen him. In fact, if you see Jesus and you touch him as Thomas did and you witness all these things, uh, it's not even faith that you have. It's just knowledge. It's experience because it, it, what I have is faith. What Thomas had was, was knowledge of, of, of being there, touching him. He didn't have to have faith. Faith is when you haven't seen. But here people are believing in him, and these miracles are what helps jumpstart it. And not only with Jesus doing his miracles, but even the, the apostles after his resurrection and ascension, and when the apostles are starting the early church, these apostles are performing these great miracles, and the purpose was to jumpstart the faith. Um, and then after a certain point, then the miracle ceased. Uh, Paul was unable to heal somebody. I forgot who it was, but at some point he could no longer heal anybody. And uh, why couldn't he? Well, be because in the beginning, it was necessary to have miraculous signs to get this Christianity, Christianity started. Uh, now we don't get the miraculous signs. We, we believe because we have the word of God. This is Dr. Peter Ruckman says, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, substance. This is a real substance. I can touch it. I can look at it and see it. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's evidence in here. As you study it, you'll find that it is very convincing. 
all kinds of detailed prophecies that were fulfilled, you know, uh, years, decades, centuries later, just exactly as it said it would happen. And the mathematical chances of all these things happening are infinitesimal. So it, it's very convincing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So now we have the scriptures. We don't have the science and the miracles that Jesus did and the apostles did. But in the beginning, it says he did this miracle and it says. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. Uh, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So this is after the wedding, the wedding party. I guess all of them have attended the wedding, the mother. It says earlier that Jesus and his mother were invited, but it seems like here he has his brethren and his disciples. And the Jews, Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. A lot of interesting things in there. So after this wedding party, he performed his first miracle. He's already declared by John the Baptist as the Son of God and the Lamb of God. And, and now the apostles are, have recognized him as, as the Savior. Uh, and now he's performed a miracle. And now he, he's into Jerusalem. Apparently he's left everybody because it says, uh, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It doesn't say his mother, his brethren, and the disciples. I'm assuming that the disciples were probably with him but probably not his mother and brethren. And what he witnesses in the, in the temple going on, uh, he's not pleased with that. Uh, and he, he, the interesting thing says he, he, uh, he made a scourge of small cords he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. So the money changers, the sheep and the oxen were all driven out of the temple with this Jesus, with this cord, this uh, scourge of small cords. It's like a whip that he made. He must have uh, just taken some... Uh, small cords and just to put it together and formed a whip very quickly and then drove them out. But it doesn't say that he struck anyone. Now, some people would you know, assume that he was striking the people or the animals and driving them out that way. But I, I, I don't see any reason to conclude that. You know, there's a, there's a principle called um, exegesis and another one called isogesis. Isogesis means you read the scriptures and just believe what it says. Take it for what it says. Exegesis says you're inserting into the scriptures what you want it to say, what you want it to mean. And uh, um, 
if a person thinks that Jesus was smiting people with a, with his whip, it's not in the scriptures. So if you if that's what you want to say or claim or teach, then that would be an example of uh, eisegesis. You're putting into it what's not there. Let me look at this in the Amplified. Verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was approaching. So Jesus went up to, the, to Jerusalem and in the temple enclosure, he found the, the people who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting at their tables. And he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Uh, then he, then to those who sold the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of commerce. Gosh, I see. Making my father's house a place of commerce. Boy, it, 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 if you've attended churches in America today, if you've watched church services and televangelists on television, then you've seen the same thing. They're turning our faith, our Christianity into merchandising, into, what's the word here? A place of commerce, a business. Uh, there's other places in the scriptures where it, it, it tells people that, uh, hey, you've done a horrible thing. You've, you've, you, you've, instead of being in the ministry for the right reasons, you're in it just for the money. Filthy lucre. I see a lot of that today. That's what he's upset about. See the... Uh, A lot of people teach that, and I, I don't see it in the scriptures. Uh, I think there's enough here that we can see why he was mad. If they were they're commercializing it, they're selling. People don't have a doves or a goat or something to sacrifice. They can go in there and buy one, they, and they exchange their money. They have so much. They have they have to purchase with a certain type of money, and they have to get the money changed, like changing money from pesos to dollars or or from pound from dollars into pounds and you so you're exchanging your money so that you can buy your sacrifice and in the process of doing the changing it they're they're making a profit the the money changers are making a profit so you, they change uh, your dollar into a dollar but they charge you a dollar and 10 cents say they're profiting profiting from this service and uh uh, I think that's that's why he's got Jesus so upset about this, and he he puts an end to it. Um, let me go back to the KJV. Uh, verse seventeen. And his disciples remember that it was written. Now, when it says it's written, that means it's in the in the, uh, uh, the 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 what's called the law and the prophets. Though those were the two categories of writings that they considered scripture. The law was uh, the I think the five books of Moses and the prophets were written by the the other prophets, uh, but those were the scriptures. That's what we call today the Old Testament. So they're saying it was written in the Old Testament because they didn't have any New Testament yet. The New Testament has doesn't start even until the death of Jesus on the cross because in Hebrews it says uh, the, the Testament begins at the death of the testator. It's like I have a, 
in my cabinet right here, I have a, I have a, a last will and testament. And the testament is not in effect right now because I'm alive. That, that my last will and testament only goes to an effect at the time of my death. That's when it actually becomes effective. And uh, that's the same thing with, with uh, Jesus and the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament goes into effect at the death of the testator. And the testator is Jesus dying on the cross. So we have, when it says it was written, it's in the Old Testament writings, which we is referred to numerous times as it's called, it's not called Old Testament, it's not called the Bible, it's called, it's called the Law and the Prophets. But he said, and it says in verse 70, and his disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. We'll probably see a footnote to see where that where they got that from. Uh, when I get to the Amplified, it gives me footnotes. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So they they are interpreting this event as a fulfillment of a prophecy. Remember I said earlier that there's all these prophecies all throughout the Old Testament talking about the Savior that would come. And uh, not just the prophecies about Jesus, but, you know, tons of other prophecies. Uh, throughout the scriptures, I have a, a video titled Proving the Bible is True. Watch that video. There's all kinds of proofs I offer, but there's a, a whole series of prophecies that I review to show you that this Bible is inspired by God. He tells the future in advance accurately. That's for our benefit so that we can have confidence in the scriptures. Um. So they take this uh, act of Jesus here as a fulfillment of this prophecy, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us? These Jews keep on asking for signs. Now, so far, the only sign he's given that we have a record of here in John at least, um, is the turning the water into wine. But he's going to do a whole series of miraculous signs for them. But the interesting thing is, even after the, the months and years go by, over and over again doing these miraculous things, they still, just before his, his uh, uh, last, you know, just before the end of his ministry and his uh, trial and crucifixion, before that, they ask him for a sign. After all the miraculous things he did that they witnessed, there's all this proof of, and yet they ask him for a sign. And he says at that time, the only sign I'm going to give you now is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And scripture says he was referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, so he, he said, that's the sign that I'm going to give you. That's the, the ultimate sign. But right now, they always want a sign. The Jews want a sign. So they're asking, they're asking him in verse uh, 18, what sign showest thou us, though, uh, show it, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and saith unto them, destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up see he's, he's promising his death burial and resurrection right there is a sign it's it's veiled they don't know what he means but then then it, they say in verse 20 then said the jews 40 and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days then it says verse 21 but he spake of the temple of his body. 20, verse 22, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said un, this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So uh, I, I thought of the example of the sign that he said about Jonah 
but uh, even here, he's saying the sign is destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. Uh, so he does say, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, raise it up. So that's another way that he's promising them the, a sign, the ultimate sign. Verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, so it doesn't list them right now here at this point here, but apparently between uh, now uh, the, these last few verses here is a gap of time and he's done a lot of miracles. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name and they saw the miracles which he did. Now, believed in his name. There are verses that tell us that we're saved by believing in his name. Salvation is, uh, you know, uh, there is salvation in no one else, no, no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Uh, so the name of Jesus is significant. Now, other people are named Jesus, but he is the only true Jesus because Jesus literally translates to God saves. Jesus is God who saves. So faith in his name means you have faith in Jesus as Savior God. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of those last two verses. Let me look at the Amplified. See if it's helpful. I want to get the Amplified on this whole last part. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, with verse 18. Then the Jews retorted, what sign or attesting miracle can you show us as proof of your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple, which was his body. So when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed and trusted in and relied on the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identifying themselves with him. After seeing his signs, attest attesting miracles, which he was doing, but Jesus, for his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and understood the superficiality and fickleness of human nature. And he did not need anyone to testify concerning man and human nature, for he himself knew what was in man, in their hearts, and in the very core of their being. Very true. Let me look at the footnotes here. Um, Uh, verse 3, the footnote is John, it says, to fail to provide for the wedding guests would bring disgrace on the groom. Uh, verse four, 4 says, literally, what to me and to you? It's a Hebrew idiom. Uh, John 2.10, or have become intoxicated. Let me look at that, 2.10. It says, and said to him, everyone else serves his best wine first, 
And when people have drunk freely, that means, or when they become intoxicated, okay? And then uh, John 2.14, they, these were vendors profiting from the sale of certain animals for sacrifice or from the exchange of foreign or pagan coins up for temple currency, money approved by the priest to present as offerings. All right, so that footnote supports what I said earlier. And then verse 24, the footnote says, for some people, this display of belief was not an, ab an abiding trust or true faith in Jesus as Savior, but merely a temporary belief based on the excitement caused by witnessing his miracles. These people, whose belief was fleeting and superficial, were representative of the followers who abandoned him later. All right, that was very, very interesting. Uh, okay, so that's chapter two. I'll uh, end this at that point. That's an ideal place to stop. Uh, next time I'll, I'll pick up with John chapter three, which is one of the most fantastic, amazing, uh, loved chapters in the Bible. I'm really excited about getting into chapter three. But as usual, I want to close every broadcast uh, telling you what is most important, what is essential. Because you can learn all kinds of things about theology. Uh, you can learn about prophecies. You can learn about the end of time. You, you, you could uh, um, learn all, all the different um, characters in the Bible, learn about them. You, you could become scholarly in the Bible and yet end up in hell. Now, how is that possible? Someone that studies and learns the Bible and end up in hell because they missed what was essential. And that is, what is essential so that you get to go to heaven? What must you do so that you can be saved from hell and end up in heaven instead? What must you do to receive eternal life in heaven? That's what is of utmost important. That is what is essential. So let me sum it up as briefly as I can here. First of all, I want you to understand that the man's way throughout history and man's way today, predominantly all over the world, has been we get to go to heaven if we're good enough. Most people think that after they die, God will judge them. And if they pass that judgment, if they meet the test, pass the test, then they get to go to heaven. And the test is, well, how good are you? Uh, it's, it's, it's commonly called the merit system, personal merit. So people are hoping that they're good enough. If you ask someone, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Almost all people say, well, I, I don't know for sure, uh, but I, I'm hoping or I think I'll go. And the reason is because I'm a good person. I mean, after all, I, I follow the golden rule. You know, I, I follow the commandments. Uh, I go to church. I even got baptized and went to confession and communion and I lit candles and I pray seven times a day on a rug. You see that people are trying to justify their salvation based upon what they have done. But our salvation is not determined by what we have done. Our salvation is determined by what Jesus Christ has done. People are trying to do, 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 and think they can work their way to heaven by doing. But Jesus says, it's been done on the cross as he dies and it is finished. Jesus did everything that was necessary for you. He died on the cross and paid for all your sins. He did it. Believe that. Give, give up on the idea that you can go to heaven by striving, by following, by serving, by changing your life, by personal merit. Give up on that. You have to discard that, abandon that and reject that philosophy. That's the philosophy that gets sends people to hell. After you've just rejected that, 
you change your mind and believe this, that you go to heaven because of your faith in Jesus to get you there. Believe that Jesus is God and he became a man so that he could die for your sins. And he did. He died on the cross and paid for all our sins. Say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You should be jumping for joy because now sin is not going to prevent you from getting into heaven because Jesus has paid for your sins. And now all you've got to do is put your faith completely in him instead of yourself. And at the moment you put your faith all on him, he gives you eternal life in heaven as a promise, as a gift, as a guarantee. I am, if you ask me, Brother Luke, or do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? I'm going to say, I am certain I'm going to heaven. And it's because Jesus is my savior. It's not because of anything I've done. It's because of what Jesus did for me. He died for my sins. He's my savior, God. Now, why am I convinced it's true? Because of the resurrection. Jesus said, when he asked him, what sign will you give us? He says, I'll give you the sign of destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. He's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. After he was crucified and died and buried for three days in a tomb, he raised himself to life. He left the tomb and he walked among his disciples and 500 people, 40 days, eating with them, talking to them. They touched him. He proved it was a bodily resurrection and he raised himself to prove that he is God and he does have power over life and death. That's the sign the Jews wanted a sign. That's the sign he gave them and us. That's the sign that gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. Now he promises you, if you put your faith in him and no longer in yourself, but your faith completely in him, he will give you eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but instead of you dying, it's referring to the second death. It's called the second death in the lake of fire. Instead of you paying that, Jesus did it for you. He, he died, he paid for your sins, and now it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The gift of God, a gift. A gift is something that you don't buy. Someone else paid for it for you. Jesus paid for it with his blood and his suffering. You don't work for it or earn it. Jesus did everything that's required. All you do is receive it as a free gift. Put your faith completely in Jesus and he gives you eternal life in heaven as a promise and you can trust him because scripture says he cannot lie, he cannot break his promise. So knowing that, you should be jumping for joy right now because you could be certain you're going to go to heaven. I hope you do it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the gift of eternal life now. now join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time for these live broadcasts. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.